Now our last lecture, basically on, on what I call these biological functions and biological systems is going to be the integument. Uh, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on our integument. Uh, remember that our integument is a very different type of integument than what we see with uh, the arthropods. Our integument is one that continues cell division underneath of what we see or skin there, the, the subdermal area. Uh, and, and those uh, cells just keep expanding out. Eventually those cells lose their water, uh, they lose their contents, uh, and become keratinized. Uh, and, and that would be the dry skin that's on, on your surface. And, and uh, it just sloughs off on a periodic basis. Now what, uh, what do we call it when it sloughs off in, in visible flakes? Dandruff. Absolutely, that, that's all dandruff is, is dried skin flakes uh, of, of keratin that, that are flaking off with there. However, in the arthropods, we're gonna find out something totally different. We've talked about the arthropods have this exoskeleton, which can be flexed, it can be bent, but it can't be stretched. And since it can't be stretched, in order to grow, the arthropod, or the insect in this case, has to periodically shed that exoskeleton and make a new one. Now, if you think about this, that's a pretty fantastic thing to do. Because I, if you think about it, I've got this shell that, that can't be expanded, but I'm going to grow a new shell underneath that. Wow. So how can I do that? Well. I basically make the new shell like a balloon that can be expanded. Once I get rid of the old shell, I can expand that new shell, do what we call hardening of it or sclerotization of it, uh, and then I can telescope it together. Remember we talked about the abdominal segments, telescoping together with the muscles and so forth. So I can molt into an individual that the potential body volume is bigger than the last instar that I had, uh, but it, I can telescope it together until I fill it up with the guts, the mass, the fat body on the inside of it. And, uh, but once I fill it up again, I'm going to have to molt and grow another one. So that's what we're going to, to quickly talk about here. Now the exoskeleton itself, I've kind of generalized this. I've, I've just indicated that it's this complex polymer material, and we've talked about polymers being extremely resistant to abrasion and, and decomposition and, and so forth. But I want to uh, indicate to you that it's even more complicated than, than that simple explanation of it. What we find, and, and I can show you this, uh, if you take an insect and make a very, very thin slice of it and put it under a microscope, you can visibly with light, you can see that there's different layers uh, in that exoskeleton under a high power microscope. You can see that there's actually epidermal cells. Now these are, the term that we use for these is that they are columnar epidermal cells. Now, where did these epidermal cells come from? Remember that ectoderm that we talked about in the embryo development? Well, your epidermis, your epidermis and the epidermis of an arthropod is from that ectoderm, that, that, that original cell layer. Now, in the case of the arthropods, their epidermis has a whole bunch of glandular capability, and that's what columnar, epi, uh, uh, columnar cells do is they usually secrete things. What they do is they secrete chitin. And the chitin is that, what we used to say, is non-living exoskeleton material. Now again, under a light microscope, when I look at this, what I will find is that visibly, I can see that the exoskeleton is in two layers. I, I can see that there's a dark, dense outside layer, and that we call that the exocuticle. This darker and denser outer layer, if we stain it, often stains darker. Uh, and and uh, in many cases, it might even have the pigments that are in the exoskeleton. They would be there. Then there is a usually thicker layer on the inside, which we call the endocuticle, which appears in the microscope to be less dense, doesn't have any pigmentation to it. And, and so it will be clear uh, in order to see that. <laughs> now, for the longest time, there was a real debate going on. There seemed to be, in, in some, if you'd make a microscope slide of this, 
in some cases you could see a very thin line on the very top of the exocuticle and, and that was called the epicuticle but sometimes when you made slides you'd see it and sometimes you wouldn't see it. Now we know why. Basically that epicuticle is a thin waxy layer that's put in there. Now you're probably not familiar with this but when you make a microscope slide you make this thin section of the tissues and then you run it through a whole series of uh, solvent materials. And they, they usually include alcohol to absolute alcohol, and then you, then you put it into xylene or toluene. Well, guess what? Waxes dissolve in xylene and toluene. And, and so it's not, you know, to me, it makes it pretty obvious that if that's a waxy coating and I'm running through this wax solvents, that could disappear. And, and it wasn't until we started doing electron microscopy that we were sectioning these uh, exoskeletons and looking through them without going through those solvents. And we said, oh, it's even more complicated than that. In a light microscope, all I can see is, is the epidermis, the endocuticle, the exocuticle, maybe occasionally the, the epicuticle. But I couldn't see that there are actually, if you take a look at it, you can see that endocuticle looks like it has striations or layers in there. And the exocuticle also looks like it has more compacted layers in there. Now, under an electron microscope, we can see that. Typically, under a light microscope, that's very difficult to see. The other thing that we became very aware of using an electron microscope is that we thought this was just dead stuff. Now, occasionally, you had a gland cell that would come up through there and, and there would be a, a tube for the glandular secretions uh, to, to release whatever they're, it's usually oils or waxes or something like that. But under electron microscope we found that there are all these cellular extensions going up in there. So now we know, especially for the endocuticle, is that there are epidermal cell extensions that go up in there. So what does that mean? That means that at least the endocuticle has living cellular tissue in there. Now the vast majority of it is, is what we would consider to be non-living uh, material, but there are cellular extensions up in there. <coughs> when we started doing some biology of this and, and uh, the biochemistry of this, what it was found is, is that uh, what we saw under the electron microscope is, is sort of layers of, of the uh, uh, exo, uh, exo, uh, cut, uh, endocuticle and exocuticle uh, in, uh, in there is that those layers are actually the chitin molecules. Now remember that the chitin molecules are basically complicated sugars hooked together in long chains with some nitrogen molecules in there. And, and what happens is that when they're laid down, the epidermal cells say, well, we're going to lay these fibers in one direction. So they lay them all in one direction. Then they say, well, we're going to lay them in another direction. And, and so they'll lay those fibers in another direction, in another direction, in another direction. So you get these different directions. Now, I find this really interesting. We use that same technique in some of our construction materials. Plywood, absolutely. Uh, now, random strand board isn't quite the same, but uh, again, in random strand board, we, we take smaller flakes and orient them different ways. But in plywood, we take a slice of wood, very thin, and lay it down one direction. Then we take another slice and, and orient the wood fibers in another direction. And what that does is that plywood, because of that orientation uh, of the, those fibers in there, can hold more weight than the equivalent piece of wood of that same thickness could hold were all the fibers in one direction. So I find it interesting. We, we think that was kind of a new thing going on. Insects have doing, been doing it for 300 million years, uh, uh, making this cross fibering in there that makes it tougher and uh, more resilient. Now, how do we get rid of this? You know, I, I, I construct this really complicated 
tough material, this polymer uh, around my body. So how do I go through the molting process? And, and that's what we're going to spend the, the next few minutes uh, talking about. So basically, if you take a look at, uh, at an insect that has uh, a mature cuticle in it, again, we see the endocuticle, the exocuticle, and the epicuticle in, in its normal configuration. We see the epidermis in there. And when an insect is ready to molt, and we, we'll talk about that in a minute, but basically there are stretch receptors in the exoskeleton. When an insect has completely filled up its body, those stretch receptors tell the nervous system, hey, this exoskeleton's filled up. You can't make it any bigger. You're going to have to make a new one. And so those stretch receptors tell the, the nervous system that that's going on. The nervous system starts producing a cascade of hormones that start the molting process. Now, physically, the first thing that we see in that molting process, when, when the molting hormone called ecdysone is released into the blood, the hemolymph, what happens is the epidermal cells pick it up and say, oh, it's time to start the molting process. The first thing that the epidermal cells is that they divide. They make more epidermal cells. The next thing that they do, and it's almost at the simultaneous, they actually, all those little cellular processes that were up in that cuticle, they withdraw those. And so now there's a little space in between the cuticle and the epidermis, and, and we call that the exuvial space. Now, what then happens is that those new epidermal cells start to produce a new cuticle. But this is, this is flexible cuticle. Uh, it, it would be what we call epicuticle in this case. Uh, and, and it's a little waxy uh, membrane, but then below that they, they start producing uh, the, uh, what's called procuticle. That just means that it, it's the cuticle that hasn't been polymerized and hardened yet. But now that they have this new waxy layer in there, there are glandular cells that secrete what we call a molting fluid in there. And when this molting fluid is activated, it has the ability to digest chitin. In other words, it can break the chitin apart. Remember we said chitin's tough. So what do you think is going to be the enzyme that's going to be in there? What do we say are the enzymes that break things apart? Aces. So what do you think is going to be in that activated molting fluid? chitinases. Uh, and, and so there's chitinases. Now what I find is kind of interesting is that the chitinase can only break apart the endocuticle. The endocuticle is still soft enough that it can be broken apart. But the exocuticle, that, that really highly sclerotized and, and highly joined together polymer at the top, even with, with chitinase can't be broken apart. And, and so uh, basically what happens is, is that, as you can see here, that molting fluid that's been activated that has the chitinases basically chews away and eats away all of the endocuticle. At the same time, there's new cuticle being laid down. But again, it's what we call procuticle because it hasn't been hardened or sclerotized. Eventually, when I dissolve this all the way out to the old exocuticle and epocuticle, that's when I do the molting process. That's when I split it open, the new body emerges out of there, and then I have this new cuticle that's virtually all what we call procuticle. What's the insect going to look like then? It's going to be really soft, and it won't have any pigments in it. Okay. Uh, we, we saw that with other arthropods. Remember, all arthropods do this, not just the insects. But then over the, the next hours, once I've shed the exoskeleton, over the next hours I'm going to define this procuticle into endocuticle and exocuticle.